Where does the church get its ideas of social justice? Stay tuned and learn the principles of Catholic social teaching. Ave Regina Celorum, Ave Domina Angelorum, Salve Gaudium, Salve Porta, Ex Qua Mundo Lutz Esorta, Gaudium Virgo Gloriosa, Superorum. Welcome to the EWTN Theology Roundtable. I'm your host, Colin Donovan, Vice President for Theology here at EWTN, and I'm here with some of our usual roundtable members to discuss the principles of Catholic social teaching. Uh, Father Mark Mary Christina of our Friars, mm -hmm. everyone knows. Hi. And uh, Cindy Cuellar of our Theology Department, and Tom Nash of our Theology Department. And we're here to discuss what is Catholic social doctrine or teaching. Uh, today, I think we all understand that uh, many of the problems which we face in our world, in fact, most of them are social problems. Uh, individuals, of course, commit sins, but collectively we can speak of the consequences and effects of those sins on society. For this reason, the church over centuries has developed a body of social teaching or social doctrine, as it's called. And this is particularly uh, put together in the compendium of the social doctrine of the Catholic Church. Uh, this is a document from the Holy See from the year 2005. And in here, it, in it has gathered all of those things from the catechism and from the encyclicals, which apply to social matters. And so uh, we're here to speak about that today. And uh, I think what we need to do is to start, Tom, with uh, something of a definition of what Catholic social teaching or doctrine is. Well, Colin, the Catechism of the Catholic Church in its glossary gives a good summary definition for us to work from. It speaks about the Church's teaching on the truth of revelation regarding human dignity, human solidarity, and the principles of justice and peace. And uh, it thus involves moral judgments about economic and social matters required by such truth, and also it um, it involves uh, moral judgments about the demands of justice and peace required by such truth. And of course you refer to the catechism because the, the catechism uh, has in different places where it's relevant different aspects of the, of the social teaching on the moral level, on the practical level regarding the role of the citizen in a society, especially a democratic society, responsibility for different kinds of uh, of uh, elements of social teaching. And particularly regarding th this topic, Catechism 2419 and following for our viewers to for further, their further reading. Right, especially to get a sort of a definitional understanding of the subject. Um, Cindy, one of the things which I think is very relevant to consider is that the, the principles of Catholic teaching don't change, although the applications obviously in different eras, different different places uh, must necessarily change, isn't that yes, true? Yes, that's correct, Colin. These principles do not change because they are deeply rooted in human nature. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 2422, teaches that the church's social teaching comprises a body of doctrine, which is articulated as the church interprets events in the course of history with the assistance of the Holy Spirit and in light of the whole of what has been revealed by Jesus Christ. So really all of Catholic teaching informs the, the Catholic uh, social teaching and there are, Father Mark, various elements of course uh, in the so many sources we would say, but principally two sources of, of Catholic uh, moral principles and social matters? Right, the church makes it clear that these are rooted in faith and reason. We can, uh, through the natural law, we know, um, you know basically the Ten Commandments there that we need to love God, you know, and love neighbor. And uh, so reason can tell us these principles of behavior, how we're to interact in a, as a community and things, but also revelation certainly perfects that, brings it to a new fullness. And I think that was a great point you made in the beginning too about the doctrine, social doctrine woven throughout the catechism, especially on the section on the commandments, uh, that it's, it's, it's living out these commandments that the church develops this doctrine, you know, teaching how we're to live as a whole, as a community. Right, and that's part of the whole approach that the church has, that we don't compartmentalize areas of our life, that we are to live a morally and humanly integral life, 
in which our political, our economic, our personal, moral, familial, employment activities, recreational activities are all manifesting the Christian character of our own our own person, of our own our own belief. And revelation then is is part of the uh, part of that, obviously. Uh, but it's something that can be arrived at, arrived at by reason, which I think is important um, uh, in the public square, is it not? Because right. sometimes we can't use religious arguments for. Exactly. Uh, I mean, sometimes we hear today, well, that's you Catholics or you Christians are saying this. It's not binding upon me. But we're saying these teachings are binding upon all. You know, the fact that we all have this common human nature, we can know it by reason, universal application. It's not just my being a Catholic that says that we form a, a human family, that we're connected in some way. So what you're saying is, uh, Father, as a priest, uh, you can basically tell us how to apply the social principles. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it is part, certainly part of proclaiming the gospel. You know, we are to bear witness to man's dignity, to our vocation, to communion with one another, and that's very much you know part of the gospel proclamation today. But always keeping in mind the di lay distinction that the church teaches the principles, it's the function of the laity and their various roles in political, economic, and personal life to to apply those principles and not, uh, so it is not the job of the church to to give exact technical solutions to political, economic, and other right. uh, other kinds of, uh, of problems. Um, I, I think from there I th we can jump into what are the uh, the four permanent principles of the church's social doctrine, uh, specifically the compendium of the uh, social doctrine of the church gives us Dig the dignity of the human person as the first principle, the common good as the second principle, uh, subsidiarity uh, as the third principle, and solidarity as the fourth principle. And of course, we're going to uh, go into each of these. Uh, the first principle, Cindy, I think is very important. It's, it's almost the starting point of any conversation uh, regarding what we do in, in society. Yes, it's very important. And and the scriptures provide us with many examples of how much God thinks about the value of the individual human person. For instance, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, we read about God imprinting His image and likeness on man, and thus has, has com conferred upon man an incomparable dignity. And in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 4 through 7, Jesus, using the image of the Good Shepherd, teaches about the shepherd who leaves the 99 in the wilderness to seek out the lost. This teaching by Christ helps us to understand that God does not think of human beings in mass A or as percentages, but as individuals. Each one is precious to him, irreplaceable. So if we look at it from God's perspective, if he is not considering the individual is simply a cog in the human race that he has created. Uh, neither are we to consider the individual as a cog in that uh, particular, but each one an infinitely valuable uh, person. Uh, I think, uh, I think the, Je the Jewish tradition even says that the entire cosmos is wrapped up really in one, in every individual, that there's a summation of of everything there. And I think that's a good reflection yes. too of this idea from the uh, Old Covenant that uh, we are made in the Im image and likeness of God. In the New Covenant, uh, we are given some specific ideas of the goodness and the image of man and, and the consequences of that, are we not? Yes, uh, we can talk about charity, loving of neighbor. I think people in modern society says, hey, if I want to be charitable, then I will and aren't I great when I do so and I give to the poor. Well, when we're talking about the gospel mandate, we're talking about our Lord saying that we're obligated to do so, that there's a sacred duty to do so because we live in communion. We are social beings. Uh, we're not islands. And as a result, it's not simply uh, something that we have as an option, but rather as an obligation as those who are in communion with others who are made in the image and likeness of God. So we are called to be charitable. It's not an option. And it's back to that, uh, I mean, you could talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan, that it's not based on a relationship of blood or nationality or religion or ethnicity or anything like that. 
It's based upon the humanity of the of the other person, which we all share. Which we all share because mm -hmm. of this uh, uh, created unity. But I think it's good to remember too, as we talked about uh, the role of reason, also that there are reason bases for considering the uh, for considering the unity of the human race and also the dignity of the human person. We have in history many examples where that was not done, where race, race or ethnicity of one group was exalted over another group, and we saw all of the injustices that flowed from that. So obviously there is a re 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 reasoned and practical wet re basis for considering the dignity of each human being as the foundation of the, of the social order. Now, we talked a little bit about the contrary views, uh, or about the, that there are contrary views and alluding to say communism and Nazism. There are other continuing philosophical positions out there that also seem incompatible with uh, the dignity of the, of the human being. Right, I think today one, the radical individualism is an ideology, ideology today that uh, doesn't recognize our, our social nature, our common dignity. And certainly, yeah, like, as you mentioned, there's many, so many threats throughout history. And I think Christianity particularly shines here in championing the dignity of the human person. I mean, you know, our faith tells us we're made the image and likeness of God, that our souls are an immediate act of creation by God. He willed each of us personally into existence, that we have this common destiny in God, that we have this capacity for God. And so our faith protects all this. And I, I read a beautiful quote by um, John Paul II in the Gospel of Life. He said, in one's neighbor, whether man or woman, there was a reflection of God himself, the definitive goal and fulfillment of every person. So we see something, this image of God in our neighbor, so we find some fulfillment in communion with them, you know, exercising, living the social we're, doctrine. Yeah, we're not, we're not islands. We're not called to be right. just self-contained. And I was thinking about um, the church has a qualified endorsement of capitalism, the free market, insofar as laissez-faire, hands-off capitalism, wouldn't, be, wouldn't provide a mechanism necessarily to prevent uh, employer abuses or might allow a trade in pornography which is against the dignity of the human right. person and against their long-term ultimate good to, be, to reach heaven. So th there, there are qualified um, endorsements of Yeah, systems. and there you're talking about the classical understanding of what liberalism was as a, a materialistic philosophy of the 19th century which uh, promoted this uh, sort of completely hands off. Just let the you know the the hand of history guide uh, economic affairs without any uh, social regulation or concern or just for, the for others. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. the market uh, mm -hmm. by itself, and that's the church has rejected that view as strongly as it rejected the view of the communism, socialism, whether the national. So uh, socialism of the Nazis or the commu communist <coughs> version of that. And that's important to remember. And, and John Paul II, when he affirmed the role of the free market that you talked about, that it can be actually the best way to distribute goods fairly, <coughs> also reinforced his criticism of the, the spe ends of the spectrum, as it were, mm. uh, wow. the completely free view as well as the completely state-controlled uh, state view. Well, this gets us to the whole purpose of the social teaching, and that really, in a way, and that is that there, there is a, a common good that has to be prepared in society and, and nurtured in society and maintained in society for human beings to flourish. Uh, one definition of that, which is given in the compendium in paragraph 164, is this, it's the sum total of social conditions which allow people either as groups or as individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. Uh, so it is a common good. In other words, it's the good of all individuals, what is necessary f on the general human level for people to flourish. And it's not a collectivity of, of individual goods as if uh, what would be good for one individual necessarily constitutes the common good. So you look at what is necessary for life and not what is uh, necessarily the, the possessions of the affluent, for instance. It's not part of the common good uh, to flourish humanly. Um, 
And even while saying that, the church still says on the basis of charity, we must have a preferential option for the poor. I think that surprises people, Cindy, that you know, when all is said and done, we must sort of be uh, biased. Is it a bias for the poor? No, no, no. The church's social teaching on using this preferential option for the poor is done in light of the Lord's universal love, which was seen precisely in his preference for those who needed him most. Now, having said this, the church also uses the term charity, and we have to have a good understanding of what the church means by charity. So when we talk about charity, charity is a love for the poor that is born of the gospel itself. Okay, so that's what charity is. Charity is not this uh, a type of political messianism uh, which sustains the illusion that a political leader or a political party will eliminate the problem of poverty completely from the world. Charity is also not um, a human perfectibility, which is a secular humanism that leaves God completely out and calls for a more secular civilization and pins its hopes on reason and on the power of technology to bring, uh, to bring forth a more just, humane society. Just <clears throat> in a way denying that there is uh, original sin or even a constituent weakness in man that inclines him to follow his passions rather than his reason, something which again, although the church teaches original sin, reason tells you the front page of all of our major newspapers every day tells us that there is this constituent weakness in man, whether you call it original sin or, or, or something else. And I think that um, uh, it, it's important with the preferential option to the poor because sometimes people choke a little bit on that, is if we're main, trying to maintain the common good, the affluent are already have the common good and they've exceeded it in terms of their personal aspirations beyond what is necessary for all people. The poor must be lifted up so that they benefit from what is uh, the common good. If they don't have the basic necessities of life, they can't benefit from those things which help them to flourish, even in a, whether it's in a capitalist society where uh, personal initiative and merit has such an important role, or in, in a more controlled society. In all cases, you need to have some foundational uh, basis for prospering. And the preferential option of the poor says we reach down to the misery of others and we, uh, we lift them up. Well, we're going to take our, our uh, first break, and when we come back, we'll continue on discussing the, uh, uh, the common good, and then we'll go on to talk about subsidiarity. So we'll be back after this quick break. <laughs> Well, we're back and we were talking about the common good, that which is necessary for all people to flourish humanly, including obviously uh, spiritually, since we're spiritual creatures, uh, those, basic, uh, those basic things. And uh, the, the church in, in the compendium puts them into three categories in, in, and plus mentions the preferential option of the poor again. Uh, the three categories are the universal destination of goods. This is a subsidiary principle of the common good. Uh, the universal right to the use the goods of the earth. And then the third subsidiary principle is private property. And that, uh, as we'll see, requires explanation. How do you balance what somewhat seems to be a little bit uh, contradictory? Uh, so, Cindy, the universal destination of goods, um, uh, what exactly is that trying to tell us? Well, God gave the earth to the whole human race for the sustenance of all its members without excluding or favoring anyone. Now, how do we know this? Well, we have the Genesis account in chapter 1, verses 28 to 29, where God says, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air. And God also says, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed which is upon the earth, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with the seed and its fruit 
you shall have them for food. Well, you can almost ask this question. Okay, well, he gave that to, to Adam, uh, and secondarily, then you can say, well, to Eve, since he married Eve. Uh, now, how, how come that then applies to every human being today? And we're back to the unity of the human race again. If you have a, uh, as John Paul II in discussing evolution said, uh, if you believe in a material evolution without God, without a uniqueness of man, a spiritual nature that rises above a pure, purely material origin, then there is no human uh, uh, uni unity of the human race. Uh, the Germans could have rightly said, or the Nazis during world uh, during the 30s and 40s, uh, we are the superior people. We have a right to more than everybody else, uh, because they could point to some. Uh, natural origin that favored them. But when you have the Christian view of the unity of the human race or even a reason view of the distinctiveness of man and the unity in, or, uh, in origin of that, then you must see that in Adam all of us were contained. In our first parents, uh, whoever they were, whatever their names, all of us are contained. And so that we, uh, we derive from them this, uh, this particular right. Um, I think there's also, too, this important consideration for the Christian, and that is Adam is told to have dominion over the earth. In the New Testament, Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, calls us to be perfect like his heavenly Father is perfect. So our dominion should mirror the dominion of the Father. And it's interesting that he makes a similar reference in, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6:26, when... Adam is told the birds of the air are part of his dominion. And Jesus tells us, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. So we should have a dominion over material things that is provident and generous the way God, uh, God is generous. And ordering that according to God's law. To according, his, to right, the according to his law, yeah. according yeah. to right reason, which is... Right. Absolutely, what is God, God's law is. Right. We have to do that. Uh, Tom, the second element is the universal right to use the goods of the earth. Is, th is that communism? No, and I think this is where we, flowing from man's personal dignity, that we have solidarity as all made the image and likeness of God, that this is a natural or inherent right, God given precisely because we should be concerned about the basic needs of all men and women. And thus, the church speaks of the universal right to use goods as the first principle of the whole ethical and social order. Now, this might bother some people. They say, well, what about the right to private property? What about the right to free trade? Those are certainly important, but they are subordinate to these other, to this primary right uh, to use the goods of the earth so as to cultivate man's good and to um, provide for his basic needs. People say, well, what kind of, what would that imply then as a primary right? Well, you might have a human intervention of a welfare of a good nature. We can speak about welfare, sadly, where people on the dole or uh, using family planning negative stuff that don't respect human dignity. That's not what we're talking about, but to provide man's basic needs, this is what we're talking about. And that's why those others are subordinate to provide and to cultivate man's basic needs. On the other hand, rights imply responsibilities. And as St. Paul says, he who does not want to work and is able to do so should not eat. And so there's that balance. And, and the pre a key word there is use, that in a way we are all stewards. So we are all called to use and our, our use of it should be responsible, should be provident as we just discussed. Um, and so this brings up the question of uh, private property and uh, how we can relate this common use with the idea of, of private property, with the value of private property. Right. Cindy cited, you know, Genesis is, you know, the creation, the whole world's entrusted to that original couple. And, and even in that same text, you know, Adam and Eve are told to cultivate and till the garden, you know, and that means developing it and we could say, you know, making it his own. You know, that's how he participates. He didn't create it from nothingness, but he participates in God's creation in that sense, that he's developing in that, developing that creation. And that means, you know, developing private property, ownership. And I think, you know, that is clearly necessary for the, these common good that, that we talk about for all people, you know, education and development of culture. 
you know, establishing a family. Mm -hmm. You know, if we have private property, certainly that helps us to provide for our family and, you know, to ensure that they have all this, these goods as well. And uh, I, I always remember when discussing private property and this, this need for the provident uh, care of the goods, say of a community, something one of my professors at the Angelicum, Father Ambrose Esser, a Dominican, uh, used to say about his uh, stint as a prior of a Dominican uh, priory in Germany and how difficult it was to get the friars to uh, t take care of things like the automobiles or their tools or something like that because it's easy to say, well, it's the communities, I use it and then I walk away from it. And so even in a community life, there has to be assignment of responsibility. It's not, right. it's held in common, but it's private property. Right. And so uh, in that sense, it's not like communism, although sometimes some Christians and Catholics will make a comparison with communism. It's quite different in the way that it views the common holding of, of possession. More like the family common goods, but yet the father, uh, subsidiarily the mother, have to be responsible for the, the disposal and actual use of, the, of those goods. And I, I think, again, it's rooted in, in human dignity. If we're going to develop ourselves, you know, exercise these talents and gifts we have, you know, that we need private property to do that, you know, to have this, this fruit of our labors. You know, we can see that and have some investment in it. But yet, it, it's not an absolute right, is it? Because yeah. it it uh, it ends when the need of others uh, is reached. Yes, and I think in that sense, you can talk about private property, not just maybe your house, but also all of your possessions, your money, and we can balance that with a right to basic health care. And, and most people, unless they're pretty not considerate of of others, would recognize the need for a, a safety net to help people in the basic needs of their health, and so that you can have a just tax uh, for such needs to help people out. Because when you ignore such needs, that's the kind of uh, seeds that lead to a social revolution potentially, which is you know, not good for mm -hmm. anybody, not contrary to the common good. Right, and on the level of principle, however, to say that it's not an absolute right, but necessary for man to exercise dominion over the earth, means that on the level of principle, there is a balance between these two things. On the one hand, in man's, perhaps if, if Adam and Eve had not fallen, uh, we would be able to have a more uh, moral possession of the common goods of the earth. That's not the historical situation of man. Uh, therefore, private property uh, may, may have been certainly involved in God's original plan, but it's certainly necessary in our present nature simply because of the, the state of man, uh, that we must balance uh, our own concupiscences uh, with the, the rights and the, the, of others to, to the universal use of, use of things. And as you said about family life and, and community life, religious community, it's different than communism. It doesn't, give, it doesn't give the government a license to arbitrarily take whatever we have whenever it wants right. to. And we, will, we will get into that in terms of the, uh, the role of the principles in governing uh, particular circumstances of, of the uh, of the society. Um, so we had the, uh, also we mentioned this sort of a fourth principle, although it's not specifically listed as such in the compendium in this preferential option for the poor. And another definition that is uh, used there is a special form of primacy in the exercise of Christian charity to which the whole tradition of the church bears witness. So. Uh, we go back to the Gospel of Luke, for instance, who wrote a good deal to, to lift up women, uh, showed a special uh, uh, role, uh, love for women to show that uh, they are equal as they were not always in every society uh, of that day, and also for the poor. So we can look especially at the Gospel of Luke to see that, uh, that, that message of the primacy of charity towards the and marginalized and the poor. Matthew 25, especially, you know, where he talks about the final judgment and his special identity with the poor, how we're going to be judged on how we treated the poor. And so there's a pretty severe command, you know. To right, whether we use, whether we treat goods as our property in an absolute sense or we are provident in their use towards, mm -hmm. towards others. Um, Okay, I think our next uh, subject is the principle of subsidiarity. Uh, definitionally, we can say that 
economic, institutional, or juridical assistance offered to lesser social entities. So when a higher, more ordered uh, social entity assists a lower uh, social entity, and without assigning uh, to this greater and higher order association what the lesser and subordinate organizations can do. And we look especially to Leo XIII in his uh, sort of the original social encyclical, Rerum Novarum, uh, who called this a most important principle of social <coughs> philosophy, and the compendium has it as one of the four uh, pillars of the, of the Catholic Church's social uh, teaching. And this is very important. It's about hitting the mark, having the right attitude, uh, not usurping, not taking away, but assisting and truly helping something be what it is by its, by its own nature. Yes, that's correct. And Blessed John Paul II in Santissimus Annus, referring to Rerum Novarum, which called upon the state to remedy the condition of the poor in accordance with justice, said, this should not, however, lead us to think that Pope Leo expected the state to solve every social problem. On the contrary, he frequently insists on necessary limits to the state's intervention and on its instrumental character, inasmuch as the individual, the family, and society are prior to the state, and inasmuch as the state exists in order to protect their rights and not stifle them. So again, back to the idea of the common good upon which subsidiarity is based. Common good is to make people flourish with all their basic needs. Uh, if, you, uh, if the state, which is a larger, higher, and in most cases the final organization of authority in people's material lives, their political, economic lives certainly, uh, is too interventionist, too controlling, then the, the ambit or the circle of personal freedom or the freedom of associations, whether it's a company or, or some other kind of entity, uh, is restricted. Now, that doesn't mean you can't make rules regarding relationships between entities so that justice is good order is preserved, but to usurp and to, to stifle uh, the freedom unnecessarily is what is being uh, uh, condemned. Um, there are a number of things which the compendium identifies as violating uh, subsidiarity. Actions and behaviors by higher order organizations and entities which do exactly what Catholic social teaching and reason says that uh, should not be done. Uh, Father Mark, uh, what might a couple of those be? Well, uh, this, like the growing bureaucracy, you mean, of the state and you know, it might have good intentions to help, uh, you know, a smaller group, but we all seen that in government where the bureaucracy can grow so much that it exists for itself. It's no longer helping to foster, you know, the industry or the freedom of the individual, the smaller group. You know, because I, I like to think of it as like, you know, we develop ourselves and we grow in the exercise of our own initiative and freedom and creativities. And if someone's coming over the top, you know, it stifles that. And so any help that a state would provide needs to respect that freedom and right to its own growth and development. In fact, the compendium has a good uh, section dealing with bureaucratization in uh, paragraph 400. It says, by intervening directly and depriving society of its responsibility, the social assistance mm -hmm. state leads to a loss of human energies and an inordinate increase of public agencies which are dominated more by a bureaucratic way of thinking than by concern for serving their clients and which are accompanied by an enormous increase in spending. So bureaucratization doesn't mean that you don't have offices and institutions and agencies that do things, but it's really about the distance between the person and the decider. That when the distance is too far, it's impersonal and it's bureaucratic in the pejorative sense of that and human freedom is stifled, and also the rights of individuals to make decisions about their own existence is, is actually trampled upon. So uh, yes. that's one. Are yes, I others? also wanted to note that Pope Benedict XVI in his encyclical letter, Caritatis in, Veritat in, in Veritate, also makes reference to this. He states, at times it happens that those who receive aid become subordinate to the aid givers, and the poor serve to perpetuate expansive expensive bureaucracies which consume an excessively high percentage of funds 
intended for development. So this was the criticism in the 80s of the great society programs of the 60s, that these had been a failure because they had stifled personal initiative, they had stifled the desire to work, they'd even fostered, as, uh, uh, as uh, Senator Monaghan, I think it was, uh, who had uh, done the studies, demonstrated, uh, perpetuated single parent families that found it was more advantageous not to get married and than to, for the welfare. That. So it, the, there is always a political decision here how to aid the poor and there can be different opinions but that we must aid the poor but yet it shouldn't be bureaucratic and simply distant and far away that is a, that is certainly a clear a clear principle of of the teaching it seems like it's a question like of efficiency of doing this well of providing and also of just growth of that individual or individual group group that we grow by making decisions ourselves and providing for ourselves yeah very often if you just if efficiency is your goal mm -hmm. uh, and that means maybe even uh, the, the money question, the taxation question. If efficiency is your, is your goal, then man is not the center of your vision. And that has certainly got to be uh, something that institutions at all levels, from local to federal, as well as social agencies within the church and privately, uh, have to consider that personal element as being more important than an efficiency or something like that. And another thought of violation would be destroying or absorbing social entities. Um, for example, the church, whether it's in uh, a communist country or the Nazis or the French Revolution, where the church is either attempted to be destroyed or co-opted. You know, you, you have the Germany, it wasn't a Catholic entity, but they talk about the Reichskirche, the Reichskirche, mm -hmm. um, that that was existing. So, okay, we'll have a Christianity, but it's going to be on our terms. And right. so we can manipulate it, etc. And so then um, the authentic church is stifled, and in fact, they attempt to exterminate it. But and, you, and you saw that dramatically in the Soviet Union, where the state usurped practically every level and function of society, even the, fil the family taking the children out of the home to educate, to raise them and educate them for state purposes, not for their own personal human fulfillment and development. Okay, uh, when we come back, we're going to go and talk. Uh, uh, about solidarity, the fourth great principle of the ch church's Catholic teaching, and we'll be back to do it after this break. <laughs> Okay, uh, we're back and we're going to round out our discussion of subsidiarity a little bit with, uh, with a couple of points and that is um, the compendium tells us that government intervention can certainly be advisable. So the principle of subsidiarity doesn't mean that governments as usually the, the larger and more highly organized uh, entities in a society uh, don't have the right to intervene. In fact, they have a duty to assure the common good. Uh, encouraging private enterprise, private organizations and associations, because enterprise suggests only economic ones, but other associations uh, to do that, human collectives, human groups. Uh, and so it is advisable, we're told, in certain circumstances, but then only as long as those extreme circumstances la last when there is a serious social imbalance or injustice which only the intervention of public authority can make to create conditions of greater equality, justice, and peace. We must think on, need only think of the civil rights movement and how that would not have come about if the U.S. Justice Department had not acted to end the persistent patterns of discrimination in parts of the country, in the South. So uh, that would certainly be a case in, this, in the or area of of uh, rights that uh, where the the government uh, should uh, would should have uh, intervened certainly. There is a danger, though, Tom, and that is that government intervention, because in democracies especially, the citizens elect their representatives, so they're not directly running the government, but the representatives are are doing so. Um, there is 
the danger of corruption of the common good. In other words, that the common good will not be respected in favor of special interests. And I think, at least in the United States today, a lot of people are concerned about the degree of governmental uh, corruption, of the role, the excessive role of special interests. What did the uh, compendium, what does Catholic teaching say about that? Well, the compendium in number 411 speaks of this, and it says, corruption radically distorts the role of representative institutions because they become an arena for political bartering between clients' requests and governmental services. In this way, political choices favor the narrow objectives of those who possess the means to influence these choices and are an obstacle to bringing about the common good of all citizens. So if you have the special interest coming forward, and they can be, you know, uh, described in any way, they could be capital versus labor, it could be uh, any other, that's an easy one that comes to mind, uh, no others do, but they could be competing, uh, competing interests. If the objective is to satisfy an interest rather than the common good, that's a corruption, that's a politics. Uh, a political corruption and is one of the gravest abuses of uh, social teaching that there is because it ceases to serve the common good which is the second of the great principles the human dignity uh, in a way it violates the human dignity also because then uh, the people who everyone who looks to the common good for what all should have uh, don't find it kind of unjustly playing to special interests instead of being concerned to the common good of all Right, and one of the uh, one of the final elements, a sub element like the uh, the principle of the preferential option, is participation. The thing that guarantees, in fact, that the special interests don't rule, uh, is that everyone has participation in in the society, and that is understood in this way activities by means of which the citizen, either as an individual or in association with others, whether directly or through representation, contributes to the cultural, economic, political, and social life of the civil community to which it, he belongs. So that can take various forms. Uh, it could, uh, in that sense, uh, a lobbying arm of, of a group of people could do that. Uh, labor, rightly, uh, fights to maintain its rights, the business associations, the, the, uh, the different the chambers of commerce, they rightly fight to, to get what businesses need, it becomes a corruption when they are favored and the common good uh, is not chosen but the special interest. So that lay all, labor gets everything it wants or business gets everything it wants rather than the politician having in mind the common good which will benefit both labor and uh, and business so uh, that's what participation uh, is about um, there are other ways in which I, I think to, we, we don't participate in a society and not just in the political because there are all kinds of arenas uh, in which we have a right to participate certainly uh, just good citizens citizenship in general, you know, uh, trying to just have that view of contributing to the common good. I mean, that's a big issue today. Our Holy Father keeps stressing is that we must have this view to the common good and not have this kind of radical individualism that's just looking after my own goods, but see my actions influencing others. You know, I, I hear so often as a priest, too, uh, you know, just in, a, in the family life, just having good a strong family life and being generous with life, how that can be such an oasis. You know, I, I just heard a story the other day of uh, a single person that was so stressed out and everything, she would just come and hang out with a family and it was so nurturing. You know, I thought what a contribution, what a participation in the common good that this family is providing. You know, these oases and, and just breaks from some of the difficulties that we all face in life. And, and that shows the wisdom of the church's encouragement of a generous family because large families generally, uh, you hear that, how nurturing that is. Right. You know, we, we make jokes about sibling rivalries and mm -hmm. uh, uh, of course uh, you and your brother I'm sure had sibling rivalries growing up. 
Uh, but That's yet, a euphemism. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, uh, in the end, it's t to have close family is extremely supporting. Now, families, of course, go on into the future and future generations. I'm wondering, uh, uh, is, our, is our stewardship today benefiting the, the future? Right. I think, yeah, the common good, we have to remember that includes future generations. And that is a huge problem today that, you know, we can be living, you know, we see that in the history of man, how we've maybe abused different groups of people, enslaved different groups, or you know, took advantage of the third world to produce very cheap goods for us. And today, I think a real danger is that we're living off the backs of our children and grandchildren, right? By racking up huge debt that's going to be passed on to them to pay back so we can live as we wish. You know, we have to remember that common good needs to be there for the future as well. Yeah, and this is, uh, this is always a consequence of human sin in the moment, that we mm -hmm. don't uh, take allowance of the ripple effect, the consequences on others. You know, whether it's our behavior in the family, which we then pass on to our children and then they repeat with their children. You know, in the worst case, it, it's, it's certainly known that sexual abuse passes between generations through the bad example and maybe even somewhat the inherent uh, sexual inclination of descendants from, from particular ancestors. But at the same time, uh, we need to take charge of that by a virtuous behavior, whether it's in the moral, the personal moral order, or by whether it's in the social moral order, uh, responsible behavior. Um, well, this principle of sol solidarity, which is the unity of the hum human family as it places certain demands of concern for the proper development of all. Common good requires it, participation requires it. So, in a way, it's a social charity, I guess you could say. Uh, we often think of the case of Solidarność, Lech Walesa. This sort of brought the name to the forefront. And um, I don't know if John Paul II uh, coined the term in terms of the social teaching, but uh, certainly I think we see a great example of that uh, concern for the common good of all in the events that took place in, in Poland back in the late 70s and, and, and early 80s. Um, There's a statement I like from that time. I think it's in George Weigel's book. Uh, one of the members in that movement in Poland said there was like a tipping point, he said, when we realize that there's more of us than there are of them. You know, speaking of the communist oppression there. And that they recognize that we really are one family and that there's a power there. How many divisions does the Pope have? Well, they realized that in June of 1979, just how the solidarity right, of the right. church of the Catholics of Poland standing up. And, and uh, certainly John Paul II, it's not that he brought this into Catholic social teaching. Obviously the idea of a social charity and a bond of unity was there. But I think this is a very uh, wonderful name and way of of sort of coalescing those principles under this term solidarity. Yes, yes. He first formulated it in his 1987 encyclical letter, Solicitudo Re Socialis. It's a social principle but it's also a virtue. It's not a, not a vague feeling of compassion. And in this encyclical, Blessed John Paul II teaches that we must seek to overcome structures of sin that dominate relationships between individuals and peoples, purifying and transforming them into structures of solidarity. So you have on the one hand, we know that we need to overcome personal sin towards individuals by a personal charity towards that person. But if there are structures of sin created by many, many common actions that favor some sinful behavior, then we need a social charity to overcome that. So there's a sort of a, a, a parallel between uh, showing a social charity that overcomes structures of sin in terms of also a virtuous life overcoming uh, personal bad moral moral habits. We have to be concerned for each other. I mean, our Lord Jesus Christ gives us the greatest example of reforming the social order by dying so that we might be uh, spared from sin and death. And we can even see it uh, par excellence in the merely human order with something like John Paul II of how he went to Poland in 1979 and became such a threat that his life, they the attempt on his life in May of 1981, May 13th of 1981, um, regarding uh, Our Lady of Fatima, which he had a great connection with Our Lady there. And the point is, is that we should be willing to, if necessary, to lay down the life 
our lives for our brethren. Uh, it's not likely that we're going to be called to that, but you know, John in his first letter, chapter 3, speaks about that our Lord in love laid down his life. We should be willing to lay down our life for our brethren. And that might just mean you know, daily sacrifice, being concerned sure. on a regular basis. On this specific uh, question of structures of sin, the Catechism of the Catholic Church in paragraph 1869 says, Thus sin makes men accomplices of one another and causes concupiscence, violence, and injustice to reign among them. Sins give rise to social situations and institutions that are contrary to the divine goodness. Structures of sin are the expression and the effect of personal sins. They lead their victims to do evil in their turn. In an analogous sense, they constitute a social sin. So there is sort of a danger that we, I think, especially in our political life and dealing in our social relationships, that we emphasize only my personal moral behavior or we only emphasize the social justice and the social behavior. Uh, back to the idea of the integral Christian, the integral Catholic, is to embrace both with equal vigor, my own personal ho holiness, moral uprightness uh, in sexual and other personal business matters, as well as overcoming the structures of sin with the same vigor by which we seek to overcome the personal sins. And I, I just read this from uh, Pope Benedict the other day that he's, he was talking about the economic crisis we're in now. The only way we're going to get out of it is through solidarity. He didn't use the term solidarity, but to have this this vision of the good for all. You know, that it's not, a retreat into individualism is not going to save us here. That, I mean, we see that so often in our lives that, you know, if we're bonded together as a group, we realize that and do things to foster that bond, we can really overcome just about anything in this life or walk through anything or find solutions for anything. And I think that's what this, that's the heart of this principle, that we really are uh, one family and that we want to see that everyone is provided for and has what they need. And lest we forget that uh, uh, just and charitable social action begins with individual personal moral action, uh, the, the compendium reminds us of the four fundamental values of social life. Truth, if we love the truth, we the truth about ourselves, the truth about our destiny, uh, then we also love what Christ teaches us regarding the poor, regarding the common good, uh, and so on. Freedom, that if God respected our freedom, then we need to respect the freedom of others unless it leads to injustices that need to be overcome. That justice itself is a due respect for others in terms of things like this universal destiny of goods, mm -hmm. as well as private property and balancing uh, those roles. And finally, love, that the, uh, love is finally the ultimate a uh, call that we all have to forget ourselves and to, uh, to serve, serve the neighbor as our Lord served us. Uh, Cindy, I know that you felt very deeply a need to, uh, to encourage and exhort us to uh, a proper self-education in, uh, in these so that we're not blind, blind ourselves and blind guides for others. Yes, yes, uh, you, to, especially today we're hearing the term social justice all over you know, media, politicians, and so on. And so as Catholics, it's important for us to know that ch the church's social teaching, to be able to expound them with assurance and, and clarity. But we also have to be mindful of another important thing, and that is to avoid the temptation of using the church's social doctrine as a weapon to judge others. Right, we always have to keep in mind that same love for freedom uh, of others that God has given to us and, and uh, as we're encouraging them to the truth to respect them. Well, we've come to the end of our program and uh, uh, just to uh, let you know that throughout the course of this year we will going, be going into different aspects of Catholic social teaching. Study the principles, be familiar with them because they are important guides to our social life in community, whether the community of the church, the family, or society. God bless. Ave Domina Angelorum, salve radix, salve porta, ex valundo lux es porta, cade virgo gloriosa, super omnes perciosa, vale